Good morning. Hello, Facebook. And the world beyond. You know, five minutes ago, we, we had a worship team. Now all we have is a drummer. <laughs> I don't know. Look, at, look, it's a miracle. Huh. You know, I had a scripture. Sorry. It says, um, stand with me this morning if you would. Come on, get off the couch. We know that you're sitting down. You need to get up out of the lazy boy and stand in front of your TV. Okay. Psalm 96 says this. Actually, there's many psalms that speak to this. Uh, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Repetitive. Hmm. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. There's another testimony, uh, or there's another verse in there that talks about uh, testimonies, and that's in um, Revelation. It talks about they'll know you by your testimony. So this morning, as you're 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 standing and you're or you're sitting or you're laying down prostrate, praise the Lord, worship the Lord, and think on the things that uh, He wants you to think on. And if He has a testimony, um, I'm going to ask for testimonies after we're finished singing and praising the Lord. And if you have a testimony, you could come up and I would give you the microphone willingly. Okay. Bless ya. <laughs> good morning. Good, good morning. You wouldn't know, but I'm a Jorgensen, but I'm a shy Jorgensen. Um, good morning, everybody. My name's Olivia. If you don't know that, I'm looking at everybody in the room. Um, this is my first time worship leading. With my best buddy Jess and my lovely teammates Russ and Trevor, um, please be kind <laughs> and generous with your praises tonight, today, this morning. Um, we're gonna be introducing two new songs, one at the beginning, one at the end. She never lets me do that. <laughs> I broke my own rules. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Good morning, and let's praise Jesus. You're welcome, Dad.
you guys have to clap <coughs> for this one, please. We really miss Dan's guitar right now. We're gonna lead with the bass though. Is that better? <laughs> it's all you, Trevor.
So our last song is a new song. It's called Show Me Your Glory. If you don't want to join in, please just sit and rest in it. Yeah, we love this song.
Thank you, worship team. Father, we uh, we love you. We love your presence. We love your still small voice. Your encouraging words. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We should have uh, communion. Can we get Mew and Shannon? They're going to come and uh, serve. Yes. Excellent. Um, I had this feeling while we were singing Show Me Your Glory that we often, oh, masks, forget that we're worthy of even asking that question because we think about the week that we've had or the ways that we've failed or <clears throat> what we've done that we know is against what God's asking us to do. But sometimes we forget the absolute miracle that is, it is that we're allowed to just invoke the powerful name of Jesus and ask for God to show up in his glory. My favorite is like Moses begging and demanding that God shows him his glory. Is it Moses? I can't remember. Elijah, Elisha, someone's hiding in a rock and the glory passes by. Or Esther, Esther preparing herself for a year before asking the king a simple request. But that's all pre-Christ. And what we're doing right now, sharing communion, remembering the sacrifice he made, remembering that he's cleansed us with his death and his blood, is that now the veil tore, and we have the authority to ask God that. And in your life, I just want to encourage you this week, like, ask something audacious of the Lord and worship in the joy that he's given us the ability to even ask that. Amen. Good word. Jorgensen. First of all, I want to say audacious, good word use, right? Points for that. But this week I was, um, just to add to that, um, I was reading something, and it said that my circumstances of the day, like you were alluding to, is not subject to his glory. His glory is not subject to my circumstances. It's totally separate. So it's like... Oh, gee. Thanks, Lord. His glory is not subject to my circumstances. My circumstances will change, but his glory does not. Good word. You folks can go sit with your families if you want, your friends. Oh, you undid it up there. Okay. I think she was complaining. I'm not sure. I, I couldn't hear her. Um, she loves me. Isn't that good? Yes. Well, you don't have a mask on, so of course I heard that. <clears throat> so, you know, your opinion of me does not change God's glory. <laughs> yes. Um, so for those of you that are silently cursing um, because of these, they're rather simple. There's a top flap, and then there's the second bendy up flap. The second bendy up flap, that opens up the, uh, the juice. These are technical terms. If you read the instructions, it actually says, actually, I can't lie. It doesn't say that. <laughs> So, 
for those of you at home, we're, we're having communion, and we, we do have fun with our communion containers. Um, so stand with me if you would, and I'm, I'm going to put this down. So you at home, you're not going to hear me. Oh, Father, you're so good. So you take the second flap and you pull it up, and you've got a little thing of grape juice. It's an emblem of his spilt blood. His blood was spilt for you. Drink this and think of him. Oh, Father, you're so good. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he, he washed away our sins with his blood, his precious blood. Thank you, Lord God. Have a seat. So, does anybody have a testimony? So my uh, wife and I are taking online Bible school. And uh, each week they have a worship session from 1 to 2 before they go into a teaching session at 2.15. And uh, this past Wednesday, uh, a little less than 20 minutes into the worship session, uh, the, uh, they dropped the feed to YouTube so the video froze, the sound stopped, and, um, uh, and you know, there's that awkward thing of, you know, what's happening? You got 150 to 200 people online listening. Oh, actually, no, it's more than that. It's more like 400. And, uh, and uh, so somebody typed into chat, which was still live on the side, uh, take this time to worship God with what you type in. And the chat just started going steady. And it turned out, uh, and somebody typed in just, you know, blessing on you all in your living rooms or your bedrooms or your offices or wherever you're, you know, logging in from. And... Uh, presence of God fell. The silence lasted for 20 minutes, and it was the most powerful time of worship that I've experienced in years. Uh, and I, I was wondering if it was just hitting me like that, and then I saw a name that I recognized of a guy who's about this middle-aged guy, and he typed in, and he says, I'm a mess. <laughs> And there are other people just saying, oh, this is so powerful. And just, and it was just amazing. It just kept building. And I found out later that certain people were saying they couldn't type a message because they couldn't see from weeping. And other people said that they were on the floor. 
So it was just, it just shows that God's enthroned in the praises of his people. It doesn't matter if there's music or not. It's the point is that we worship him and he responds. We enter into his presence with our worship. Thank you, Murray. He's so powerful in the silence. <laughs> That's good. Anybody else? Come on, Cheryl. So, Jesus, he's present with us all the time. And this week, I'm alone a lot, so I get to call on him because I'm never alone. And um, I wanted to build these flower boxes. My brother cut out these pieces of lumber for me, and, but I didn't know how to do it. And so I called out my neighbor. I said, do you think you could help me put together these things? And he looked at them, and then he went back home and said, yeah, maybe on a nicer day. And so um, then I'm just sitting there, and I think, well, that's good, because yeah, it's kind of rainy today. And then I heard this still small voice say, I am the carpenter. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Oh, do you want to build these boxes with me, Lord? And he said, yeah, yeah. And so together, first he gave me pictures because when I put them together my way, they didn't form a square. And then he showed me that I had to put them, like, and it's just a picture that he puts. I had to put them on different sides of the board. And then, you know, I'm saying, well, okay, now we've got to hold these two pieces together, and I've got to hold the drill. I'm with you. Every step of the way, he was with me. And we built four of these boxes. And I just praise God. You know, it's like we think, well, this isn't big enough to call out. You know, I have to do some things on my own. But it's not true. He is there to help us with everything if we're willing to ask him. Yeah, he's a carpenter. He, he talks to us like that, doesn't he? He's a carpenter. I'm a carpenter, you know. Yeah, I agree with that testimony. And I've seen that happen over and over and over. And uh, just in little things. But I believe, I truly believe that living with the Lord gives you an extra edge in life. In, in those little things that you don't realize, like, okay, for, and this is over and over stuff. It's the favor of God, really, is what it is. Even, even he knows what you need, right? So, so I'll just share this one. Um, so I broke my glasses there a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, ah, tried crazy glue. It held for not even a day. And finally, I'm like soldering it up and like just wrecking. They're, they're getting all destroyed. And I'm like, I really need some new glasses. So I phoned up the, or I contacted the optometrist. And, yeah, I, I just need some new glasses. Well, we're booking into April. I'm like, oh boy, that's not going to help me out. <laughs> I'm like, ah, well, you fill out this form. We can put you on the cancellation list and hopefully maybe you'll be able to you know, squeeze you in if you're flexible. I'm like, okay, let's do that. So, so a few days later, I'm chatting with a lady in, at work who just had eye surgery. And uh, 
I was asking her about her eyes and stuff and how, how that was going. And it was, you know, it was going really well. And I mentioned, yeah, I got to get in and get my eyes checked. It's been a few years. And I broke my glasses and I can't get in till April. She goes, well, isn't that funny? Because I was just about to call the, the optometrist here and cancel my appointment for next Monday. <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> so we phoned them up and... Uh, and uh, gave them the situation. They got the information. And I said, do you think I could sneak in to, you know, to get take that spot? Sure enough, they said yes. And there we go. And, uh, and so it's not just, you know, she felt that I was very lucky. But I don't think luck really plays into it. I think it's the favor of God that he just walks with you. And, and little things that he helps you in, like just, just the day-to-day -day stuff that you're working on, right? Why did that go together so easily? Or, or why? how did this work out so well? You know, and, and it's because of him. So I give him thanks for that. That's good. Amen. Pastor Stan. I don't, don't see anybody else, so Pastor Stan. Amen. So let, let's pray. Uh, just reach your hands forward towards Stan. Father God, I, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for uh, how he hears your voice and how he takes what you're saying to him and how he turns it so you're saying it to us. Thank you, Father. I pray blessings on us as we sit and we listen to your word preached. Let it just rain down on us. Anoint us to hear, give us ears to hear, and a heart to accept. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan, for leading our service this morning. Powerful testimonies, wonderful testimonies. Excellent worship this morning and just a sense of his presence amongst us again this morning. What a joy to be here. And to experience that, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I, uh, oh, just maybe a couple of little announcements. I don't know if we made them today, did we? That's okay. I can preach them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, come tell us about Thursday night, Russ. Heck. So this Thursday, February 10th, uh, 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Thursday, 6.30 p.m. at the church. Please come. Please come and pop in. And we want to we wanna invite all who are interested in, in uh, worship, worshiping, or even just being a part of, of, uh, of uh, that ministry or just whatever ideas you have even, bring them. Uh, we want to see where, where we want to go as far as um, people learning new things in worship, as far as uh, whether you want to try instruments, singing, uh, sound, tech, whatever it is, come. Um, this is a great opportunity to be involved. Come and, and, and we're going to, we want to see what works for people as far as uh, you know, what people are looking at as far as uh, practices or getting together, too. Some people, different days work. Some people can't quite commit to a weekly thing. That's okay. We're going to find out what works, and we want people to be involved in however, if they're feeling led, right? If you're feeling led to be involved, come on out Thursday at 6.30, and we'll, we'll find out. We'll just uh, kind of have a, a time of uh, getting together and talking about things, and then making a plan for this year so and, and on a second note to worship if you're uh, already on the team uh, please 
get some names in there on the schedule. It's online, just a reminder. And, um, and, and uh, also a reminder for Gabby to get working on the... <laughs> we'll see if she's listening. <laughs> on the month or the year-end report to, for the AGM. <laughs> All right, I better get out of here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder on the uh, announcement stand. So the AGM will be on the, the 20th of February. At, at what time? Uh, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. There we go. 7 o'clock. And uh, the votes of thanks, uh, the paperwork is uh, at the back of the church. W is it on that table over there? Yeah. Okay. It's on the table at the back. Um, and Alan Jorgensen has been nominated uh, for the deacon position. It's all yours. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Russ. Good to know what's going on. So this morning, uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, about something, um, about God's Word, and just fill on the time I have to share things with you. Uh, last week, I talked about Elisha and uh, a woman whose son passed away and how God intervened. And... Uh, Good morning, Bethany. Good to see you. Today I, I want to talk to you about something else. What, what on my heart today is, is to remind you about God's Word. And particularly God's Word as, as it relates to um, my posture. My posture and our posture towards the living Word of God. So I want to talk about our posture and God's Word. And the verse that came to me was from the Gospel of John chapter 6 and, and verse 63. And in John 6, 63, here's the words of Christ. The Spirit gives life, in John 6, 63. The flesh counts for nothing. In other words, the flesh, my ability, can, will not allow me to understand or to receive from Him. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have, have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. One of the things to look at it from this perspective, firstly, I would point out that Jesus is saying that his words bring life to us. Life comes to us through his word. He said, the words I speak are spirit and they are life. His word is the vehicle that the Holy Spirit uses to give us life. The fullness of life, the, the purest form of His life. You, you can't, I believe Jesus is saying, you, you cannot separate God's Word from the Holy Spirit. You cannot. In the story before us, they tried to do that. They weren't relying on the Spirit. And he said, and he's saying you can't do it. The words I speak to you, they are Spirit, Jesus said, and they are life. Why? Jesus incarnate in the flesh, speaking the very words of the living God, the Spirit of the anointing of the Spirit of God is all over him, right? right? They are Spirit and they are life. And so... You cannot separate this in our day, in our moment, in this second from the Spirit if you want to have life, right? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, 
we used to use the King James and it says all scripture is inspired of God. It is the inspiration of God. Uh, more modern translations have got a little, little more in our vernacular, in our language, when it says all scriptures God breathed. That's what inspired means, right? Right? So, you know, we use the word inspired in so many ways. But, but when we're talking about the Bible, when we're talking about God, all scripture is God breathed. When, when it was written, it was breathed. It was the breath of God, and human beings wrote down the breath of God. They wrote down the words of God, the life that God was saying. His word, you see, is alive. His breath, his breath created the world. He said, let, let there be light, right? And there was light. His, his breath breathed into a pile of dirt and man became a living soul. But he only became a living soul when God breathed into his nostrils, when God breathed into him, right? It's his breath. And so Jesus says, my words, they are spirit and they are life. They are the breath of God that release the creativity of God, the life of God, right? All of that is contained within that. Jesus is saying that I need the Holy Spirit to breathe his word into my spirit, right? Right? This is what we often term, it becomes real. It is reality. It is rima. Whatever you hang that on, that's what the Spirit of God is saying. Within that context and within that reality and understanding of the amazing word that he's got, whether you hold it with leather copy as I do or you have it on your device, that's not the issue. Is his it is word that is breathed on by his spirit to us. One of the things I think that the Lord is saying when we look at John chapter 6 and verse 63 and 64, within the context of that whole chapter that he's speaking to us, is he's speaking, one of the things he says to them that are listening to him as we look at that is he's saying to them, your posture towards what I say is vital. Your posture towards what I am saying to you today is essential. What do you mean by posture? Well, you know, posture. Your attitude, your stance, your approach, the way you are viewing what I'm saying, the, the way you, you, you know, all of that. And so he's saying to these religious people, he says, your posture is inhibiting your ability to receive the life as the Spirit is sitting upon the word that I am bringing to you. For they are spirit and they are life. That's what he's saying, right? And so John chapter 6 states that, that, that in, in that chapter, as we look at a few verses around it and hear, listen to the story of what's happening, that they, they have approached his, his word and what he is speaking and what he is sharing with them, the words of God, right? He, they, they are approaching it with their human mind. They are approaching it with their human effort. And they're also doubting as he speaks. They, they have a variety of preconceptions and postures that are hindering them from taking that life and seeing it transforming and implanted within them. And if we were to put ourselves into some of the other things that, that are going on in their heads and, and the way they're viewing, their posture, if you will, is their preconceptions were stuff like this. They weren't looking 
for who Jesus was. They were looking for a deliverer from Roman power and Roman rule. They were looking for a political Messiah because it was a mess. They, they, they were looking as well to get what they could from what God offered with their human skill and their human effort and their human understanding of their theology and of the basis of what was in the Old Testament, the law. And so he said to them, so, so, that, so they're, 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 they're agitated, they're not getting it, they're pulling back in their spirits and in their hearts, all of that is going on. And Jesus is, I mean, Jesus is sharing life, right? Jesus is trying to implant to him his reality and the nourishment of the living God that they can touch the Spirit of God in them, and they weren't getting that because of their posture. So my thought today is it's really important for us. See, there's nothing wrong with the Word, and there's nothing wrong with the Spirit. But what is sometimes the struggle is our posture towards the Spirit and towards the Word. For His words are Spirit and they are life. And so, so, so here's a few things, probably around four-ish. Four-ish. <laughs> Sounds like a time. Anyway, four-ish. I've covered all my bases, Dan. <laughs> Let's evaluate our posture. It's always a good thing to do. Our posture towards His Word. The first thing is I would remind us this morning is this, as we think about our posture towards His Word, is that the Lord requires for us to be implanted with this. Is he requires of us that we listen. Listen to God's Word. I mean listen. I mean listen. Not, like listen. I'm not, I'm not talking about the stuff where you're talking to somebody and the lights are on but nobody's home. You know, right? You know where, where it just seems like their eyes are glazed over and they're somewhere else. They're thinking about the hockey game or the football game or they're thinking about what they're making for supper or whatever it is. Lights are on, nobody's home. We're talking about listening, to be attentive. It says in that same section of Scripture in John chapter 6, before he gets to verse 63, which we all often quote, he says in the 45th verse, it says this in the New Living Translation, he says, Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. Right? Everyone who listens to the Father, he learns, she learns, and comes. John 6, 45. So, so I need, Jesus is saying, so I need to place myself into a position, into a posture that I hear His word. And to be honest, sometimes I need his help. But you see, in their day and in their minds, there's a lot of human effort going on. So it's up to me to figure out how to listen. No, it's not. I mean, you have a part, obviously, but he can help you to listen. Is that right? He can help you to focus. Even in that. It says in Psalm 119, verse 18, in the Passion Translation, in Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes to see the miracle wonders hidden in the Scripture. Isn't that beautiful? Open my eyes to see the miracle wonders hidden in the Scripture. What a beautiful prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Open my, help me listen. Open my eyes so that I can listen. Other, open my eyes so I can hear. Open my eyes so I can see. Open my eyes that I can get revelation. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. So the listening is such an important key within that. To listen and to listen with the Spirit. To ask Him to help you to hear. 
See, it says in Romans 10, 17, Romans 10 and 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to listen. And so in John chapter 6, we find Jesus is speaking to them. And one of the things he's saying to them, you're not listening. You're not listening. Boy, listening encompasses a lot, doesn't it? Sometimes we're not really listening because we're wanting to justify what we believe. Because we already made up our mind. So it don't matter what you say to me, I'm not listening because... I already know. I already know. Right? Or we're listening, but we're not listening because we're listening to grab the key points on what you're saying that I can use against you to point out that I'm right and you're wrong. That's not listening. That's not what Jesus was talking But that's what they were doing. So they were not receiving the life that he was offering. They were not listening. So listening is such a... A, a very vital point that Jesus makes here in John chapter 6 and in the New Testament to us. Listen, listen. And to be honest, I really do need his help. And that's why I think it's important. It's more than a tradition to us, too. When we, we have the word and somebody prays for the word as it comes forth, Lord, help me listen. Right? I want to listen. Lord, help me hear. Right? That's part of what we're doing here. Right? When we get up and Dan prays for the word, Lord, help me hear. Right? We use all kinds of words. Sometimes we don't use the word listen. It doesn't really matter. But that's what we're saying. Lord, open my heart, right? So that's one thing Jesus is saying in here. For his words are spirit. And his word is life. But another thought. Another, another thing. So, so have a posture. Nurture a posture that listens to the word. Nurture a parser, have a posture that, that also, this is so important, and I know we say this from time to time, but it, is, it doesn't diminish the fact of how significant and important it is. And that is, our posture must be one that accepts. We must accept his final authority. We must have a posture that accepts his final authority. Now, let's unpack that a little bit. His word must have the final word in my life. His word must be the final word. It must have that final word for my life. It, his word must be the ultimate source of truth to me. It must be, the, in other words, it must be that trusted Primary trusted bedrock foundation to me. I trust his word and him beyond trusting me and trusting what I'm hearing. Because it's word. It's not just a positional authority. It is a trust based on relationship with the living God that he would breathe the reality of his word into your life. Proverbs Chapter 30, and the fifth verse says, Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is flawless. So we can trust because his word is flawless. We can, he is the ultimate authority. One of the things in that is his flawless. What do you know in life that's flawless? him right there are so many and, and yet at times we say that but we don't stop sometimes to think and to evaluate that to ensure and to continue to 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 refine if you will and allow him to to purify and help us to get more and more into that place of taking him as his final authority because we get bamboozled or deceived, if you would prefer to use that word, bamboozled. I like that word today, just because I don't use that word very often. So, so we get kind of bamboozled into looking at his authority through certain filters. And, you know, so, so, so we adopt his authority through other authorities. 
that we trust a little bit more, and so we look at that, but we've already kind of set it up a certain way that this is what I believe, and how do I justify that from what, how do I adapt his word into what I believe? Now, we don't necessarily think it through that way, but it's the position of the authority of who he is and what he says and of his spirit in our lives that determines the fullness and depth of the life and the presence of his spirit moving in our life and flowing through our minds and the arteries of our spirit man and being, allowing us to receive as much as possible of who he is within us and outside us and underneath us and over top of us and surrounding us. Culture is one. Let's look at a few of them. Culture. Culture. We adopt and we can't, we are all touched by culture. Awareness helps, right? Just being aware. We're all uh, have adopted a cultural perspective on things. But we can make culture, our culture, when we don't realize that it is affecting us, we can look at the Word and what He is saying to us through our culture or through the people that are in our world. Everyone else believes this, so it's right. So what He is saying must be interpreted with what everybody else is saying. And so, well, I don't really agree with that. What do you mean you don't agree with that? You know, like, 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 I may not like what he says, but every word of God is flawless. Now, there's sometimes I've taken what he said and I've just took, taken it out of context and I need to, and I'm confused. And that's a whole other area. I, I don't have time to get into that today. Right? Right? And we see that kind of abuse all the time. If you live more than a few minutes. You know, Right? So I'm not talking about that today. But what I'm trying to say is that our posture must see that beyond, above, and around, and underneath is, is, is Him, right? That, that really, you know, He understands culture, He understands where I live, but, but He has to have the final say on that. I must be willing to hold that lightly in comparison to who He is, right? Right? Because God's Word was, was given in a certain culture, we need to recognize how, what that actually meant within the internal mind of God and how that comes down to the culture we live. Uh, you, know what I, you know what I mean? Like there are certain things that he said here because of what was happening. So we need to understand, and the Spirit of God helps us to realize, well, this is what the eternal truth of God is. And how is that fitting the, in, into where I'm lived here? But our problem is, is we just go skip through this way. No, you're not living in the desert in Sinai right now. You know, you're living in Port McNeil. And there's been a few thousand years have gone by. You know what I'm saying? Culture. Tradition is another one. Tradition can get us into trouble as well. We have to have a posture that sees not that my tradition is the final authority, but that his word is the final authority in my life. You know, that, the old one, I haven't heard it for a while, and I'm so glad I haven't heard it for a while. Thank you, everybody, that I haven't heard this for a while. We've never done it that way before, right? I still remember the first time I heard it. I was a young guy. I, I was. One day I was. And, and, and it was my first year pastoring. And uh, so they wanted to have a watch night service because they always had watch night service. Well, they didn't tell me what to do. They didn't tell me how they did it. So they left it up to me. I'm the pastor. Well, I'm 20 years old. I don't know. Any. But anyway, so I'm in charge, right? So, so I had to come up with a program of what we're going to do for, for New Year's Eve. And you know what I thought? Watch night service, well, we'll pray. But the best thing you could do is at midnight is preach in the new year. So I thought that was great. So anyway, so I got up there. And so I said, well, now we're going to look at the Bible. Now we're going to look at the Bible. We had just prayed, so it's 12.01 or whatever. So I opened up my Bible, started preaching. And one of the elderly saints in the church said, 
I think he thought he was quiet, but everybody in the room could hear him. Well, we've never done it this way before. And I've heard that statement a few times. Whether I did the right thing or not is not the issue. The point is, we can't just limit things because we've never done it this way before. It's like grandma's ham. And you heard this story about grandma's ham? There's uh, this young man, he marries this, this girl, and she cooks a ham. And so before she sticks it in the oven, she cuts it in half. And then she puts half the ham into the oven and cooks the ham. To which her husband, young guy, curious, he was, says, Say, uh, hon, why do, you, why do you cut the ham in half and only cook half the ham? Well, because that's the way you cook ham. Yeah, but why didn't you put the whole ham in? And he, he kind of talked to her, asked her a couple of questions, and she finally said, well, well, because mom taught me that way. That's how mom did it. Oh, okay. So now he's really curious. So then when he has a chance to see mom, her mom, his mother-in-law goes and talks to her. He says, so your daughter cooks a ham, and she takes the ham before she puts it in the oven. She cuts it in half and puts it in the oven. And so I was just wondering, she said she did it because she learned that from you. So, so why do you do that? You know what her mom said? Because that's how you cook a ham. And he said, yeah, but why would you cook it that way? Why would you take half the ham away and just put half of the ham in? And he says, because that's how you cook a ham. And he says, well, where did you hear about that? How did you get that idea? Well, my mom taught me. So he goes over and visits grandma and tells her the story. He says, so just got married and so delighted to be married to your granddaughter, and so this is how she cooks a ham. And I couldn't understand why she cooks her ham that way, but cutting half and only putting half in. So I talked to your daughter. She told me the same story. She said that you taught her how to do that. So, so Grandma, why do you take a ham and cut it in half before she put it in? Well, she started to laugh. And she says, well, I cut my ham in half because our stove was one of those small stoves. So we bought a small little roaster, you know, to fit in the little stove. So I, I didn't have room for a full ham, so I cut it in half and put it in the oven. So it made total sense that she cut the ham in half to put it in the oven because the whole ham wouldn't fit in the oven. But m daughter figured out that's how you're supposed to cook a ham, and then the next generation goes down. Now you've got this tradition that makes no sense. But at one point it did make sense. But sometimes we have traditions that are just like cutting half a ham, and we say it's got to be that way because we trust that that's the way it should be. Or it's like our approach to boundaries in our lives. I can remember for years, it's gone now, Alan, but down at beach camp for years they had that, they had the gate there, you know, and they had a gate, and, uh, and there was the, the roadway that went around the gate. And it was the funniest thing when I first came to Port McNeil, you know, because I, I went down to beach camp, and here's this gate, and you see the roadway to the gate, and then the roadway and the path had tracked for years down around the gate, and there's this rusty gate that's locked, right? But everybody's going around the gate, right? And, uh, and, and you thought, what is that about? So one day I found out. But, but the point is, sometimes we end up with these boundaries like rusty gates that we're going around. We don't even know why the gate's there. So far, what, what, what happens sometimes is we build a fence or we build a gate. And we build a fence and we mitigate because we recognize maybe, for example, we have a weakness in a certain area. We have a vulnerability in some area in our life. Some, some area that we're prone to, if we're not careful, it would lead us into sin. And so we put up some kind of a, a boundary, some sort of a gate, some sort of a, a post, some sort of a system that just says, I can't go there. I can't go into that building. I can't go into that place within the town because if I do, it's going to cause me an offense right? I had one fellow I knew that he was a terrible, just terribly addicted alcoholic in the, our first church in Surus, Manitoba. And I told him, listen, you can't even walk by the pub. I said, you walk by the pub, you smell it, and you're in there, and you're gone. I said, you need to walk around it. You need to walk a block away, because you just can't handle that right now, you know, so forth. But you can see, you can come up with a whole new tradition from that, right? See, for him, that, makes, that would make sense. But then his son 
starts realizing he's not allowed to go down that way, you know, and his grandson, and now you got this whole other tradition again. There's nobody's allowed to walk down that road. Nobody knows why anymore, but it made sense for Grandpa. That's like some traditions. Some traditions are good. But what happens is we begin to hold our culture, we begin to hold our traditions as sacred instead of holding this as sacred. It's okay to have boundaries and it's, good. it's okay to have gates that make sense in your life. But it's His Word that is the authority in your life. Or our reasons become an issue. It's just logical. But God says, don't make no sense. So my logic trumps what he says, because what he says isn't making sense to me. God tells us, you know, to attend church. He tells us to respond in worship. He tells us to read our Bibles. He tells us to share and to live within his values. And sometimes our reasoning and our thought process doesn't line up with that. But we need, what are we trusting? Are we trusting in my ability and my reasoning, or are we trusting in the infinite mind of God? Right? Or our emotions. That can become something that is a posture that limits us to and becomes a final authority in our life because, because it just feels, doesn't feel right, or that feels right and opposite to what God says, or, or I'm comfortable. And so our thing is, uh, I disagree with anything that doesn't make me comfortable. If I'm comfortable, that can't be right. Right? But we mix up the fact between the discomfort that the Holy Ghost allows you to get in and the discomfort that just because we don't want to move. Right? Emotions are good things. But like Billy Graham used to say years ago, emotions are supposed to be the caboose, not the engine. Right? And, and, and so, 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 so my, the point again is his word and what he's saying to them, my, my, my words are spirit and life. That life and the spirit flows through us and into us with the capacity that we will look to him as the authority in our life and his word is the authority in my life. Take Peter. It all sounds a little abstract to me. So let's look at a story, the story of Peter in Luke chapter 5. Tremendous story. Here's Peter, Luke 5, first few verses, right? Remember that story. Here, I'll tell you the story. So here's Luke chapter 5 in a nutshell. So, so Jesus comes along, and he's teaching this crowd, and there's lots of people, and they're pressing against him up against the Sea of Galilee, and Peter and his partner had been out fishing. They came on, they caught no fish, no fish at all that night. So they're in the morning, they're exhausted, probably double exhausted, because they've been up all night and they got nothing, right? It's bad enough to be tired and worked all night, but also to feel I didn't produce anything is makes you even double tired. So he's tired, and, and, and they're cleaning the nets, getting ready to go home and sleep, and then they'll try another night, right? And Jesus is there, and he asks for permission to use their boats. And so they're just cleaning the fish, and the boat's empty, and so they push the boat out a little bit, and Jesus got in the boat, and he taught the crowd, right? Afterwards, Jesus being Jesus, appreciated the fact that Peter made himself available and blessed, allowed him to use his resources and what he had. And so he said, basically, Jesus says, let me do something for you. I'm going to bless you. Let's take your boat and let's grab those nets and let's go on a deep water and let's go fishing now. And Peter's response is this. We fished all night and we caught nothing. Jesus the carpenter. I love that today, the carpenter. Jesus the carpenter is speaking to seasoned fishermen and he's saying to them, let's go fishing. And Peter's mind, his experience, his reasoning, his tradition and his cultural understanding is all crying out to him, there's no fish! I know there's no fish. This is not my first time out, right? 
But it says in Luke chapter 5 and verse 5, he took the posture that Jesus' word, the living God, the master, was indeed the master. And so he said those beautiful and amazing words filled with faith and trust when he said, because you say so, I will let down the net. I love that whole story because he told Jesus how he felt. Lord, we fished all night. We caught nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. You can be open and honest with the Lord. But when it all comes down, it must be nevertheless because you say so. I will let down the net. And they did. And they, they be, their boats began to sink in the blessings, right, of all the fish they caught. It's an amazing story. Jesus' word must be the authority. Jesus' word, we must have that kind of a posture, that kind of mindset that, it, that, 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 that his word is the authority in my life. And if we will, it'll help us so much to be able to receive what he has for us and the life within it, the spirit that's within it, that was intended to set us free to bring so much to us. Another thing I believe Jesus is saying in this is that we treasure a posture and nurture within us a posture of, of humility before his word. Let us be people that look at his word with humility. John chapter 5 verse 39 says this, you study the scripture dig- diligently, because, diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You are reading your Bible you are reading the scripture, you're, and yet you are not hearing, it says in the 37th verse, 37th verse, you are not hearing his voice. How sad is that? That you could read and not hear his voice. And yet he says that. It is possible. So faith is truly a posture of humility. I need faith to understand and to receive because my mind is limited compared to his mind. So I, in humility, choose the place of not relying on my resources but on his resources, right? Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, this is the one I esteem. He was humble and contrite and trembles at my word. That's the one I show myself to. That's the one I bring life to. That's the one I bring understanding to. That's the one I release power to. That's the one that gets the flow of my reality in him or her. This is the one I esteem. He was humble and contrite, trembles at my word. There's a recognition of all of that. And again, Peter in Luke chapter 5, we see his humility. Humility is observed. He sees the authority of Christ in his life, but he also says, yet because you say so. What's he saying? Lord, I've got this experience. I've got this reasoning. This is my understanding, and yet I'm going to tell you that. Right? (laughs) Right? But I also know, great God, that you know more than what's going on in this little section of the Sea of Galilee, that you are actually the creator, and so you can move outside my experience and make it work. So, you know what I mean? So I, I, I humbly, right, don't take what I know as, as the final. I take you as the final. And he went out and he caught fish. Right? And lastly, it is a, and quickly, something we know, and that is, it is, it is, it is, is we must have a stance that is, that is faith related as we look at his word, right? There is that humility, there is that recognition of authority before him, and as, as we're saying, and, and, and listening, but that, that all, underneath it, over top it, all around it is this faith posture. 
You know, and it's all over that. When Jesus is speaking here in John chapter 6, verse 63 and 64, it's a, it's a faith posture. It says, it, in other places, throughout the scriptures, Jesus said in Hebrews 11, verse 3, the Bible says, by faith we understand. By faith we understand, right? When I open the Bible today, it, it, so, so today, this morning, when, the, when we opened up the Bible, when we looked at it, was 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 there an expectation in your spirit, in your heart, that I am going to hear something from the Holy Spirit today? I'm going to, I'm going to get something from God today. When you opened your Bible, when you began to listen. See, that's a faith posture. God has something for me. We prayed. It's not about the vessel. It's about my expectation, my heart, to hear what the Lord has to say in my life. Right? Luke chapter 5, again, the story of Peter. Faith was exercised. There was obedience. He was struggling with his faith. <laughs> I'm sure he was. But in it all, he said, Lord, nevertheless, right? I take what I got, and I choose to trust, right? God honors that stuff. He really, really does. And so Simon Peter acted on Jesus' word. So my word today to you is simply that. We have the privilege of receiving the life of his word, his breath, in our daily lives. And he said in John chapter 6, verse 63, which I started with, the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe. Let us not be in that camp. But be those that say, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe. Beyond what I feel, beyond what I'm going through, beyond what I understand, I choose to trust. I choose to believe. Amen. So, Lord, we come to you today and we thank you that your words are spirit and your words are life. Lord, we acknowledge your authority in our lives. We choose to listen, and Lord, you know we struggle to listen at times, but by your spirit, help us to be good listeners. Help us, Lord, with our posture to always be humble before your word. And, Lord, to exercise faith. For faith allows us to get it. And to receive your life. So, Lord, that we pray today. Breathe on us, O Holy Spirit. Breathe on us. Not just this moment, but daily and hourly and moment by moment. Breathe on us, O God, in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, folks that have been listening to us online, live stream. Glad you could join us. May you have a good week, all of you. God bless you.